When the Fellowship in The Lord of the Rings meet the Balrog, it is for sure a memorable moment in the story. What is this entity, a foe beyond any of you, Flame of Udun, Durin's Bane? Even Aragorn has never seen something like this before and Legolas identifies it as Balrog of Morgoth. A mysterious being and mystery bears curiosity. I often get questions about those mysterious beings because of this. Jonathan Ho asked, do Balrogs have wings? This sounds like an easy to answer question, but it wouldn't be talking if there wasn't more to it. Also Jean-Luc Martel asked, how did the Moria dwarfs release the Balrog? Where the hell was it the whole time? Who put it there? Before we start, as always, I try to pronounce names as Tolkien described it or as it makes sense. And spoiler warning. Balrogs are high servants of the first Dark Lord, the Valar Morgoth. As explained in many videos, Tolkien's world has one god called Eru Iluvatar. His high servants are the Valar. They are like high angels, but they also form something like a god pantheon. And those Valar have also servants the Mayar. The last two groups are spirit beings called Ainur, having usually a physical form. The Valar Melkor rebelled and destroyed the creations of the others. He should become known as Morgoth. Some of the Maiar followed his rebellion. The best known is probably Sauron, who was second in command and later becomes the second Dark Lord. But also Balrogs are Maiar, led by Gothmog. We can read in the Silmarillion. And in Utumno, he gathered his demons about him, those spirits who first adhered to him in the days of his splendor and became most like him in his corruption. Their hearts were of fire, but they were cloaked in darkness and terror went before them. They had whips of flame, Balrogs they were named in Middle-earth in later days. As an interesting side note, there's also a Maya in orc form mentioned in the history of Middle-earth books named Boldog. Maiar can take a physical form to their liking and power and potentially even change it later. Sauron was known for this, but I assume not all could do this in an instant or whenever they wanted. Having a physical form was an investment of power. However, all who rebelled fought with Morgos to conquer Middle-earth and destroy the elves in a region called Beleriand. I explain this in my Sauron and Law of the Elves video in much more detail if you're interested. Balrogs were very successful in these wars. Only at the time of the fall of Gondolin, it can be assumed that the first Balrogs were slain by powerful elf warriors like Exelion and Glorfindel. It must be noted that Balrogs were less powerful and more numerous in earlier concepts of Tolkien, as we can read in the Book of Lost Tales. Tolkien changed his mind later and so we got an entity like Durin's Bane. Then, after many centuries of war in Beleriand in the First Age and after Balrogs have slain many elvish lords and even kings, the Valar themselves intervened and attacked Morgoth in the War of Wrath. This destroyed Beleriand and led to Morgoth's defeat, who was chained and thrown into the void, which ended the First Age. Sauron, very few dragons and very few Balrogs, however, managed to escape. We can read in the Silmarillion. The Balrogs were destroyed, save some few that fled and hid themselves in caverns, inaccessible at the roots of the earth. This is a quite interesting detail and leads directly to answering this question. To me it seems that the roots of the earth are a place of secret and mystery in Tolkien's works. When Gandalf and the Balrog fell in Lord of the Rings, the wizard sees the nameless things that even Sauron does not know about. The dark depth below the earth bears secrets. And that symbol or concept makes of course sense. If you have ever visited a mining facility, you see how people under great effort try to bring the secret treasures of the dark earth to light. What is below the earth or the mountain, we don't see and if you want to uncover it, you have to work hard for it. The Balrogs made use of this and hid deep below the earth. Even Morgoth tried to do this. We can read Morgoth fled into the deepest of his minds and sued for peace and pardon. 
When you don't want to be found and be forgotten, becoming a secret of the earth is probably the best you can do. The Balrogs also made use of this before. The War of Wrath was not the first big war of Morgoth and the Valar, but when the Elf first awoke and the Dark Lord found them first, beginning to corrupt them, the Valar started the war for sake of the Elves to free them from him. The war took place at Morgoth primary fortress Utumno, also known as Udun and which makes it clear what Flame of Udun means, but also his second fortress Angband. In the end the Dark Lord, still known as Melkor at this time, was captured, chained and imprisoned for three ages. We can read Nonetheless, the Valar did not discover all the mighty vaults and caverns hidden with deceit far under the fortresses of Angband and Utumno. Many evil things still lingered there and others were dispersed and fled into the dark and roamed in the waste places of the world, awaiting a more evil hour. This includes the Balrogs who hid in the Dark Lord's second fortress Angband. When Melkor returns and is attacked by Shelob's mother Ungoliant, he cried aloud. We can read Deep in forgotten places that cry was heard, far beneath the rained halls of Angband in vaults to which the Valar in the haste of the assault had not descended, Balrogs lurked still, awaiting ever the return of their lord. So Balrogs seem to hide deep below the earth in vaults and caverns when their master is not around. Maybe a reflex, maybe part of their nature. In addition, that's the safest place if they don't want to be found. And considering that there are still Balrogs, at least one in the third age, they were quite successful with this. In a quote above I read, their hearts were of fire, so their core essence of their form was associated with fire. Fire in Tolkien's universe is connected to earth. Tolkien described that the heart of the world, or you could say the earth, is fiery. So there is definitely a connection between the fiery nature of the Balrogs and the earth too. And that's how they got there. Now it's easy to understand how the dwarves fit into all of this. They dug too deep. As mentioned in my video about the Endwives, the bodies of the dwarves were originally made by the Valar of smithing Aule and he made them stone hard, which fits to the earth where they prefer to live. As elves love the growing things above the earth, the dwarves love the things below it. Mountains are for example described as the trees of Aule. And in Khazad Doom, later known as Moria and one of the oldest cities of the dwarves, through the power of the seven rings they got from Sauron, they became greedy and dug deeper and deeper to uncover all the secrets of the earth. They must have been very deep because Gandalf later uses the endless stair to follow the Balrog from the deepest caverns to the mountaintop Kelebdil. The stair is later a legend for the dwarves but was actually built by them once to get access to the deepest depths under the misty mountains. And here they uncovered one secret that should not and does not want to be uncovered. It should become their doom, the bane of their king, Durin the Sixth. And so when the Balrog was found, he destroyed them and their kingdom so that he would become a secret or a legend at best again until fate itself would change this. And that's basically how the dwarves found it. But do they have wings? I really like the depiction in Peter Jackson's first movie. It covers a lot of little details but also interprets some things into it that can be debated and some would say it's not very accurate to what the books describe. I think the question was mainly inspired by the detail that the Balrog falls down. If Durin's bane has wings and can fly, why fall down into the abyss? Well, Balrogs most likely have no wings and if they have, they are not sufficient or made to fly. There is another instance of a Balrog falling to his death, which was in the fight against Glorfindel, who is also in the Lord of the Rings. He was re-embodied after he fought a Balrog in the First Age in Gondolin, where both fell down into an abyss and died. But there are some instances that indicate wings though. In the Fellowship of the Ring we can read His enemy halted again facing him and the shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. And 
The Balrog stepped forward slowly on the bridge and suddenly it drew itself up to a great height and its wings were spread from wall to wall. The shadow about it reached out like two vast wings. This clearly says that its shadow changed and it looked like wings. So it's more a description of the shadow. I think it's called simile in English. So in this case it's a metaphor that compares something probably easier to imagine directly to something that is actually more abstract or complicated to describe. If we get back to the beginning their hearts were of fire but they were cloaked in darkness. So Balrogs are shadow and flame. The film depicts that shadow component with something like smoke. Which I think is a really neat interpretation for something so difficult to depict like darkness. Especially in the combination with fire. But what's with the other quote? And suddenly it drew itself up to a great height and its wings were spread from wall to wall. This line follows shortly after. So it is in my opinion still part of the same context regarding wings. When Gandalf gets angry at Bilbo in back end we can read Then you will see Gandalf the Grey uncloaked. He took a step towards the Hobbit and he seemed to grow tall and menacing. His shadow filled the little room. Since Gandalf and Balrogs are Ainur and Maiar it's not surprising to find a parallel here. And I would argue that this means its shadow that is like wings spreads from wall to wall while it increases its presence so to say. Like Gandalf did and also his shadow grew larger. I could imagine that this is a gesture of readying for battle and striking fear into the hearts of enemies. Some animals show a similar behavior when they feel threatened. But since the wizard is the Maya himself it does not work on him. There is another quote in Morgoth's ring that shows a line that was later changed a bit for the Silmarillion and describes the Balrogs moving with winged speed over Hithlum to Morgoth's aid. I would again see this as a metaphor but can see how you can easily imagine flying Balrogs when reading this line. In the end it was also changed for the Silmarillion. In the video about death I talked a lot about the complicated meta canon. But as explained earlier if they could fly they should not fall down so often. If these shadow wings would exist and have a practical purpose maybe it helps them to move faster but I would still argue that they can fly. When it comes to the looks of Balrogs they are not described having horns. This interpretation is most likely inspired by the mentioned line and in Utumno he gathered his demons. In some cultures demons are depicted with horns like in many western cultures. The first thing that came to my mind is Dungeon Keeper. Of course in the context of Tolkien's works this is not very likely because horns are in most cases only mentioned as instruments in the books. In earlier concepts and notes of Tolkien Balrogs also wear armor and a helmet. So Shadow of War took probably inspiration from this with their Balrog. They have fiery whips and Durin's bane is described having a fiery sword too. Moria's Balrog is also described as dark figure streaming with fire and flames came out of his nostrils. The size and form is very debatable but early drafts indicate that they were no giants and only a bit taller than a man. Similar to Sauron. In the Lord of the Rings there are also some small hints going into a similar direction. Quote what it was could not be seen. It was like a great shadow in the middle of which was a dark form of man shape maybe. Yet greater and a power and terror seemed to be in it and go before it. So it was probably formed like a man, maybe, potentially bigger but it's not clear how big and fire was part of it too. I clearly see how the depiction from the films came to life and it covers many details like flames coming out of their nostrils. But the description is vague and indicates something looking remotely like a man and less like a horned beast. Still I like this interpretation. Mythology never tries to describe something precisely. Instead it tries to transport the core and the core ideas of a Balrog are a whip a humanoid form, something that spreads terror through its presence, power, fire, darkness, shadow and shadow wings. Thank you for watching. 
If you want to learn more about some of the events including Balrogs from the first age I recommend my Elf's Law from Kirdan's perspective video as mentioned but it's quite long. Also my Sauron video covers this too. Basically watch my stuff. I have also gaming related videos. I hope you liked this episode. I personally really like the Balrog part in the books. Imagine going through this ancient forsaken dark mine city below the earth fighting hordes of orcs and then something far more dangerous approaches from ancient times so powerful that it once wiped out the entire kingdom becoming a legend known as Durin's Bane and it's a supernatural entity made out of shadow and flame. If you like this video consider pressing the like button and leave a comment. How do you like the film interpretation of Durin's Bane? Also this format lives from lore questions from the comments so feel free to post more. I prefer more simple questions because this format is intended to be shorter which of course often doesn't work but you should know me by now I tend to make longer videos. I also answered all questions from the last vote so probably time for a new one. If you ask yourself what's coming next. I don't know, there is one video I plan, I'm not sure if I should really make it. That could be the next one, it's not law related. Law wise I plan to make a video about Tom Bombadil but no clue if I can manage to finish it in December. But it will come at some point. Maybe I answer a new law question before it. At the end of the month I plan making a little my top games of 2018 video or something similar which has some unusual picks. I wish all who watched this in December a nice and peaceful advent season. Again thank you for watching and goodbye.